Oh, I didn't see you there. Well, welcome to church. My name is Harmon. So glad that you are joining us uh, today. Maybe it's a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Sunday, whenever you're watching this, just want to give you a special welcome. If it's your first time here, we actually want to talk to you directly. We have something special for you. You can text the word hello to this number right here, and uh, we would love to get connected with you. Um, as a church, we are no longer meeting in person. We're meeting online, and the church is online. So it looks a little bit different, and it looks different to connect. It looks different to be in groups. It looks different to just do church life in general. And so if you're looking to get plugged in, that's an easy step for you. Just text hello to that number and we'd love to plug you in. Uh, as well, uh, we're going to be singing a couple songs today and we're going to have a message from Pastor Jeremy a little later on. And so uh, why don't you get up right now? Why don't you stand up, stretch out, get ready, and we're going to jump into worship today.
cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone you are from house to house from home to home there is hope in your house we lift up the name of Jesus we declare there is no one like him there is no one beside him come on wherever you are we start to lift him up and we give him praise we start to thank him now for your healing thank him for your breakthrough thank him for your salvation thank him for putting your family back together come on we sing and we lift up lift up the name of Jesus
Wow, thanks for joining us for church today. Uh, I'm excited that you're here with us, and I love seeing all of the interactivity and the comments happening. So if, if you're on YouTube right now, give us some thumbs up in those comments. If you're watching on Church Online, on our website, or you're over on Facebook, get those little heart buttons going right now. I want to see all those hearts. There we go. There we go. That's amazing. I love it when we get to do church together. You know, the book of Hebrews says, don't neglect gathering together. And though we're not gathered together in the same way, uh, we are gathered together this way for such a time as this. And I know God is doing something in your house and in your home right now. Maybe you're watching and and you're new to faith. You're on a new journey. Uh, And if you're looking for a Bible, we want to be able to get you a Bible. All you have to do is email hello at scatteredsaints.ca. That's right. You just email this email address right here and you can get your own copy of a Bible. We'll deliver it to you. We'll get it to you however you need it. Hey, if you're watching today and you're like, you know what? I just, I'm going through it. I'm feeling it. This, this, this quarantine is getting to me. Well, I want to let you know that we're here to help. Right now, there's a phone number showing up right across the bottom of the screen, 587-400-2010. If you give that number a call right now, we've got someone who's ready and wanting to talk with you and to pray with you, to help walk with you through this next season. You know, just because we're physically distant doesn't mean we have to live alone. The scriptures say that God loves a cheerful giver. And it might seem difficult to be cheerful at this time. But I think about Christmas morning. Do you remember the excitement that you had when you would wake up and rip open all of your presents on Christmas morning? I can tell you that my excitement level has only gone up as I race downstairs to watch my two sons rip open their presents. There's something about giving. When you give, I want you to know that you're not just investing into infrastructure operations, you're feeding families. You're literally putting food on the table for people in our community who need it most. Did you know that we deliver hampers? We deliver meals? We deliver groceries? We, we, we will take to you and provide you what you need in this season. But it only happens through your generosity. So I just want to take a moment to say thank you for giving. And maybe you're feeling like, ah, I'm just down right now. I wonder if you would consider investing into a family, investing into a meal, investing into spreading hope from house to house and from home to home. If you want to give today, if you're watching online, you can hit the give button. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, there's going to be a link that's going to pop up in the comments. You just hit that button and we can give today. Thank you so much for partnering with us and for doing it in a spirit of joy and gladness. Thanks for watching today. Let's go to an amazing, life-changing message with Pastor Jeremy. All right. Well, hello, hello today. It's good to have you with us. Whether you're joining us online, we're starting a brand new series called Welcome to Church. I got the Zoom crew here with me, and uh, you can give them a wave, and we're going to dive into the scripture right away. If you have a Bible with you, turn in it to Genesis chapter 26. And uh, as we go there, and as we start this new series on Welcome to Church, uh, we've had to think differently about what it means to be the church, to look like church. How do we experience and encounter God the same way we have in church, but in a different way from our homes. And this morning or today, wherever you're watching, I want to come and bring a story about a guy named Isaac in the Old Testament in Genesis 26. And I think it's going to help us as we make our way forward in a season where we're going to have to dig in a little bit deeper in our relationship with God and our experience with him. So if you have your Bibles, Isaiah, uh, Genesis 26, verse 14 to 19. And it says about Isaac, he acquired so many flocks of sheep and goats, herds and cattle and servants that the Philistines became jealous of him. So the Philistines filled up all of Isaac's wells with dirt. These were the wells that had been dug by the servants of his father, Abraham. And finally, Abimelech ordered Isaac to leave the country. Go somewhere else, he said, for you have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away to the Gerar Valley where he set up their tents and settled down. He reopened the wells that his father had dug, which the Philistines had filled in after Abraham's death. Isaac also restored uh, the names Abraham had given to them. So Isaac moved away to the Gerar Valley where he set up their tents and settled down. He 
Uh, Isaac also restored the names Abraham had given them. Isaac's servants dug into the Gerar Valley another well of fresh water. Why don't we pray today? Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you're doing and what you're speaking. I thank you that when we come under the sound of your word and your voice, it's alive, it's powerful, it's living, it's active. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. Now, Isaac was a guy that we don't talk about as often in scripture as you might talk about Abraham or Jacob. And he was kind of right in the middle there. We talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob throughout scripture. And Isaac is probably the least talked about out of the three patriarchs of what we call them. But Isaac had an interesting story here that happened in Genesis chapter 26. You see, when Isaac went into this land and he started to flourish and he started to grow, there was a famine and he was flourishing. And I believe that God wants to do that in some of our lives. And he started digging wells to bring life and a life flow to his family, to his people, to his community. But as he was doing that, the Philistines who became jealous of him or enemies that rose up started filling in some of the wells that his father Abraham had dug. So Isaac goes on and he starts digging some more wells and we read about this. And in total in the story, he moved from place to place to dig new wells and he digs seven wells in total. Often I think as we look at these encounters in scriptures and I think as we look at the things that people, the men and women of God faced throughout the Bible, we find that very often the call and promise of God and the life flow of God in someone's life never comes without opposition. And often in our lives, I think the way we've looked at church and we've looked at life, it's been amazing and there have been pioneers that have gone before us and there are people that have established some amazing things, but every once in a while there's an opposition or something that happens and we have to rethink and evaluate and look at our own homes and our own lives and the type of well that we've actually dug for ourselves. You see, I believe that scripture so carefully paints this picture of a generational God. He's a God of generations. And one of my favorite phrases in the Bible is in Psalm chapter 78, verse 7. And it says this it says that each generation, every generation should set its hope new on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his command. Every single generation, every single move of time, every single age and bracket of people living at this time, the Bible says that every generation needs to remember what God has done, look to him for what he is going to do right here, right now, and look forward to him as our source and sufficiency for the future, because it's a generation to generation thing. And so Isaac knew this, and he knew this principle. And, and, and the three guys that we're talking about, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, actually display this picture so wonderfully in the Bible. You see, Abram had an encounter with God in Genesis chapter 12, if you want to go read about it there. But God calls Abram to leave his country and go pioneer a new nation, a new land, and he gets up and he does it and he walks out in the promise of God. Isaac who was Abram's son, comes to a point in his life where he watched his father walk and he watched his father do some things, but he had to encounter God for himself. And it says that in these passages that Isaac encountered God and and the promises were reestablished in his heart and in his family. And then Isaac had a son named Jacob. And Jacob wrestled with a lot of things in his life, mainly his character, and he had to wrestle with God, what am I gonna allow you to do in my life? And it comes to a point in Genesis chapter 28 where Jacob has this encounter with God. He has this dream and he's a stairway with angels going up and down to heaven and he wakes up, he's like, man, God is real and he's here and he's moving and I didn't even realize it. And it says he named the place Bethel, which means the house of, of God. I think it's funny that Jacob named the place Bethel house of God because oftentimes if you grew up in church or you've been around church, um, we look to the house of God. We look to the place of worship as the place that we experience and we encounter God. And that's what it should be. And that's what we aim to do week after week. But when we're in a time and a season like we're in right now, my question for us today is this. 
if we're gonna be the church, if we're gonna live our lives like the church, if we are gonna experience the power and presence of God right now, today, does your home or my home look like the house of God, the place where he dwells, the place where we encounter him? See, Isaac's story is kind of a blip in the book of Genesis. When there's a lot of talk about Abraham, there's a lot of talk about Jacob, and there's actually a lot of talk about another guy named Joseph. Isaac has a few chapters where we see him mentioned in the story. And it it says this, in Genesis chapter 20, we see Isaac's birth. In Genesis 22, uh, he has this incident with his dad where his dad says, son, we're going to go up the mountain to worship and uh, his dad is going to sacrifice him, but God stops him, provides a ram. That's a crazy story if you want to read Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 24, uh, he gets married. Uh, Genesis 27 and 28 is uh, this wrestling match, this toil that comes between his sons. He has two boys and all they're doing is fighting. And then Genesis 35, it mentions his death. But right in the middle of all of that, the real pertinent story that we see about Isaac's life is Genesis chapter 26, where he moves into a land and he's trying to prosper in a time of famine and he has to put in the work, get his hands dirty and dig some of the wells that his father had opened for him, but the enemy was trying to close up. You see, when we get back to Genesis chapter 26, Isaac is facing these enemies that are filling wells that have been opened for him. A lot of us in our lives, we, we love church and we love experiencing church because someone paid a price, someone paved the way to show us how to encounter God, to encounter Jesus, to get into his presence. But sometimes when we're separated from that or we're not together, we wonder where's that same presence and where's that same feeling and what is going on? So Isaac starts opening some of these wells again and he starts digging and he digs some more wells in Genesis 26 that starts bringing hostility and it starts bringing arguments, but he doesn't give up. He just keeps digging. And then he digs another well, and finally he says that God's made room for us. He's made a place for me, and my family can experience the life and power and presence of God and the promise of God. There's a future here. And then when he digs the seventh well, he calls it the well of the oath, meaning it's fulfilled. It's a promise that God's promises are going to happen. And, and, and I don't know what you're facing right now in your home. I don't know what you're facing right now in your walk with God. I don't know what you've been facing if you don't understand this whole COVID-19 thing and what really is happening and how God could you allow this or how do we respond? How do we experience your goodness and your grace? Can I tell you right now that God wants to bring a life flow to your home, to your house of his presence, of his power, of his goodness, of his faithfulness, But sometimes the things that we face and and the struggle that we have, it can start to muddy the water and it can start to fill in the things that once flowed so easily in our lives. See, I want you to know this morning that there's there's a flow of God, there's an encounter with Jesus that's worth going after, it's worth pursuing. You see, the well represented for Isaac the life of God. It represented hope. It represented future. It represented the promise of God that his family could multiply and grow and be sustained and move forward in the promise of God. And I I believe that for your home and my home, experiencing the presence of God will be the thing that in this season right now will give us hope and a vision and a future that God is still leading us one step at a time, that he is moving us in the direction he wants us to move and we can be the church he's called us to be and we can lead lives in our homes like God wants us to and we can actually find fulfillment and a source and sustenance because it comes from God not from anything else and maybe you're struggling right now but you need to know that how you respond in this season in your home whether you dig a well or not, is critical. It's critical in this day and in this season because Isaac realized that people 
were watching. Isaac realized that as he faced all the hostility and all the arguments and and all of the things that he had to face going from well to well to well, he had two little boys that were watching how he would walk out his relationship with God. He had family members depending on him. He had nations around him that came to him after and said, we see that God has done something in your life and they were watching. You know, it's funny how we sometimes forget who's watching us. I remember one time I was in a laundry room in one of our houses and uh, there was a big mess in there and uh, I don't know if I tripped or spilled something or whatever, but uh, I, I did something and some words that came out of my mouth were very quickly repeated in a small voice that was like mine, but not quite at my age yet. And man, it stung deep because you realize that even in the moments when you think in your home or you think in this season that you're alone, your family is watching how you carry the weight and the stress and the pressure and all of those things. And I, and I started to ask myself some questions about this season that we're in. If we're gonna be the church and if we're gonna lead people to know that, that God is for them and he wants to be their source, I, I, I want us to ask this question. Do I wanna dig a well or do I wanna dig a hole? See, because the choice is really ours. We can, we can go after something and put our time, energy, and effort towards digging something that brings lasting life and value. Or we can dig into a whole lot of things that actually one day when this is all over might leave us in a hole or a trench of demotivation, discouragement, a feeling of just being stuck. And I believe that God wants us to dig in to the life and presence that he has for us. And sometimes for some of us, if I'm really honest, it was easier when we could come to a building and we had a couple hundred, you know, maybe even a thousand people raising their hands, worshiping with us. Because when other people dig in, it just seems all that much easier for us. But when you're at home and it's you and it's your wife and it's your kids, What are we digging? What are we going after? What kind of life are we trying to bring forth in our home? See, remember, I don't believe that we can experience the life of God without putting in the digging. I don't think we can dig a well of prayer in our homes if we don't dig deep in our own prayer lives. I don't believe that we can dig a deep well of worship and gratefulness and gratitude if I first and we first don't take it upon our own hearts to say, God, I wanna feel your presence. I wanna draw close to you and I wanna dig deep in the areas that you have for me. You see, we become the church when we start digging deep into our relationship with God and actually start becoming more like, looking more like Jesus because the life of God starts springing up from inside of us. You see, we can't let other people dig for us all of our lives. And right now we're in a season where we are gonna be challenged on how to dig deep in our walk with God, how to go after his presence, how to experience and encounter him in a real way in our own homes. I think we also have to remember that sometimes it gets a little bit messy when we have to dig and it isn't always that glamorous. A few years back, I had a house where uh, there was beautiful pink rock on the corner lot surrounding my entire house. And I was very sick of the pink rock and I did not want it there anymore. So I uh, put a Kijiji ad up and I said, if anybody wants this ugly pink rock, I didn't say that. I told them it was super expensive and, and very valuable and some people like that. And truckloads of guys came and shoveled this rock into their trucks for me. But what I did was I thought, I'm just gonna put down uh, some dirt and I will resod those areas. And so what I did was I picked up the phone and I made a phone call and I, I phoned a trucking company. I said, just dump a truckload of dirt on my driveway. And I didn't really think this through because when they came, uh, you know, it wasn't a huge truck, but it, we're not talking like a pickup truck. A tandem truck bu- backs up and dumps a pile of dirt on my driveway. And then I realized I can't get my vehicles out. And my plan was to, when I had time, 
take this dirt from one side of the driveway and put it where it needed to go. And I started digging a little bit and I got about an hour or, you know, maybe 10 minutes into doing this. And I thought, this is stupid. This is messy. I shouldn't be shoveling in white shoes. I, 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 I don't want to do this. It's hot. And, and sometimes when we get to different areas of life, I think just like that, where I said, you know what, enough of this. I don't want to deal with this. And what I ended up doing was I knew a friend who had a bobcat company and I called him and he actually spread it in 10 minutes with his bobcat to where I needed it and it was done. But sometimes what we have to remember is when it comes to the presence of God and the life of God and a peace of God and a strength of who he is that comes from prayer and worship and character development and so many things that God calls us to as the church before we can be the church, it takes a little bit of digging and sometimes it gets a little dirty and sometimes it's a little bit messy and sometimes it's hard work, but we can't bypass it. And today, what I want to do for each of us, before we dive even deeper into this series of Welcome to Church, we're going to unpack this for a while, but I want to challenge us from the story of Isaac to dig deep in a few areas today. See, first off, I want to challenge you today to dig deep and don't allow enemies to backfill or backstop areas that you've already dug out. You see, one of the things that might happen in this season is when you say, I've developed a relationship with God, I've learned how to worship, I've learned how to pray, it gets busy at home, the house can get chaotic, and then we just say, well, I just don't have time. I used to go to church and that was my time. And the enemy will do anything that they can or he can to to backstop and, and cut off some of the good things that have been flowing in your house already. It might be busyness, it might be time, it might be disappointment, it might be discouragement. And when all of these things start flooding in and they can actually start robbing us of the life of God in our house and we actually need to get our hands dirty and dig some of those things out and we need to start dealing with the disappointment, dealing with the discouragement, dealing with the busyness, dealing with the unfocused nature that maybe we have right now and say, I need to get this time back so I can make sure that that life of God keeps flowing in my house and in my heart. You see, I remember that when uh, my kids were little, they would always want to help me, whether it was shovel the driveway or move dirt or something like that. And my wife would get mad at me because she'd say, let your kids help, just love them. They just want to help you. And and I realized after the first two times I did this, it, it took me way longer because wherever I was moving snow from, they were putting new snow on. And they were backfilling the work that I had already done. And in Isaac's life, when he began to prosper and things were good, but there was a famine everywhere else, there were enemies that came that were trying to backfill the areas that he had carved out for his family. The promise, the future, the the life of God. And maybe we don't have everything vying for our time and our attention right now. But there'll be so many things that try to come in and cloud your heart and cloud your home and stop you from continually keeping that well clean so you can experience everything that God has for you. The second thing that I want to let you know about is that I want to challenge you from the story of Isaac to not settle for less than God's fullness in your life. When Isaac was in this story, if we read Genesis 26, verse 19 to 22, it said, Isaac's servants also dug in the Gerar Valley and discovered a well of fresh water. But then the shepherds from Gerar came and they claimed the spring. They said, this is our water. uh, And they argued over it with Isaac's herdsmen. So Isaac renamed the well Essek, which means argument. Isaac's men then dug another well. Again, there was a dispute over it. So Isaac named the well Sitna, which means hostility. So abandoning that one, Isaac moved on and he dug another well. And this time there was no dispute over it. So Isaac named the place Rehoboth, which means open space. For he said, at least the Lord has created enough space for us to prosper in this land. 
sometimes valleys, sometimes difficult people, sometimes frustrations of life, hostility, can be an interruption in the things that we're trying to do. If you've tried to serve Jesus for any period of time and you take this one step at a time, as you go down the road, the minute you feel like you're making progress and you're growing in an area, all of a sudden there will be voices that come. When you wanna go after something, there might be voices that don't agree. There are arguments at times. There's frustrations at times. But the one thing we need to learn from Isaac is that he didn't quit and he didn't give up. Maybe there's hostility in your home. We need to make a way for that to move aside and so we can put the gratefulness and the thankfulness and the life of God back in our homes. See, hostility and arguments and uh, you know, difficult people or difficult seasons is not a reason for us to give up from going after the presence of Jesus. Because the presence of Jesus is what will change your life, it'll change your heart, and it will change the way We interact with everyone around us and it will change the way the world sees us and sees Jesus. See, God promises us fullness and sometimes we stop short. But when Isaac dug the seventh well, he called it the well of the oath. He called it the seventh well and it meant fulfillment. It was the number of fulfillment. It was the promise of God being fulfilled. It was the marker in his heart that said, I'm not gonna give up until I have everything that God has called me into. So don't let enemies fill in areas of your life that you've already moved forward in. Don't don't let hostility, people, arguments, frustrations become the thing that cause you to give up. But the last thing that I wanna challenge us with today is this. I hope that you would realize with me that when we dig and we go after the presence of God and we dig deep, it's not just for us, it's for the next generation. I believe that more than ever in this season and in this time, that the things that we dig into in our homes, the things that we dig into in our heart, the wells of prayer, the wells of worship, the wells uh, uh, of pursuing who God is in this moment, in these seasons, are actually gonna be the starting point and the source that starts spurring the next generation towards going after God and his fullness for them. The things that we dig into now will actually be the marking points that when we're out of this season, that will reflect to the world and to people around us that God is doing something in our lives. In Numbers chapter 21, there's a scripture a little bit later in the story where Moses is in the wilderness and they had to dig a well. And it says that, Moses called all the people together and in Numbers chapter 21, verse 16 and 17, it says this, it says, from there the Israelites went on to Beer, a well, the well of which the Lord had said to Moses, assemble the people together and I will give them water. Then Israel sang this song, spring up, O well, let all sing to it, let the fountain that princes open, that the nobles and peoples hollowed out from their stave. There is a call for each of us to call forth the life of God in our hearts and in our homes. I want your home, I want my home to be a place where we experience God's refreshing, where we experience his peace, where we experience his hope, where we experience his joy. But sometimes it takes some effort and sometimes it takes some work because there are so many things that are gonna vie for your time and for your energy and want to distract us and to backfill the things that God has already done in your life. It amazes me that in this story, when all the people came together and they sang this song, Spring Up a Well, I have to believe that it was every generation from the smallest child to the oldest elder. And they began to call forth the life of God. And I wanna give an encouragement to those of you that have gone a little bit further and a little bit deeper in your faith. Now is not a time to say I've paid my dues and I've done my part. We have houses and families and people that need you to dig a deep well and to pray for them and to uphold them and to believe God with them and to keep leading them by example into the fullness and the life of God. Because the next generation might not get there 
without us praying that they experience everything that God has for them. And we wanna be that example and we wanna go that direction. And my challenge for us today is this. If you're in this place and you've been following Jesus and you've been serving him, dig deep. We're gonna go into a season to understand what does it mean to be the church? What does it mean for me to lead my house, my home, my family, to be a light to my neighbor? Start in your own heart. Dig deep. Dig the wells of prayer. Dig the wells of worship. Dig into the presence of God so you are marked by it and you are known by it. But lastly today, I wanna ask this. Before we make our way into another week, maybe you're joining us and you've never had a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you don't even understand some of the things that I've been talking about. Can I tell you that God wants to bring his peace and his life and his presence into your heart and into your home and you can have a relationship with him. You see, Jesus came to earth and he died for us so we could experience the life that he has for us. In the, in the gospel of John, he stood up one day and he said, if anyone is thirsty, it's the same well imagery. He says, if you're thirsty, you can come to me and drink. In another portion, he's with this lady sitting at a well and she was broken and hurting and, and she was avoiding other people. And Jesus says to her, he says, if you knew who I was, you would have asked me for a drink. I want you to know today that Jesus wants you to experience his life, his peace, his grace, his goodness. And we wanna give you an opportunity to make that decision. And I'm gonna close with this scripture. Isaiah 41, verse 17 and 18 says this. The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues fail for thirst, but I, the Lord, will hear them. The God of Israel will not forsake them. I will open up rivers and desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valley. And I will make the wilderness a pool of water and dry land springs of water. Has your world felt dry? Has it felt broken and cracked? Has there been a longing or something that you wish you could fulfill, but nothing has done it yet? I said before, you can dig into a whole lot of things, but they might just dig a hole that leave you feeling stuck. But you can dig into or you can receive the offer of Jesus. You can come to him and you can drink and you will be satisfied and fulfilled and find the peace and life and fullness of God. So if that's you, wherever you're at today, you can start a relationship with Jesus. We're gonna pray a prayer together. You can click the link in the profile or, or, or the Jesus button and, and we want to walk with you. See, even though we can't be together in the same room, we can still walk together and teach each other and love each other and help each other know what it means to walk with Jesus one step at a time. So if you made that decision today, would you just repeat after me? Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, I need you. I need you. Now more than ever. Now more than ever. Would you come into my life? Would you come into my life? Would you fill my heart? Would you fill my heart? I give you my sin. I give you my sin. I give you my shame. I give you everything. I give you everything. I ask you to be my Lord. I ask you to be my Lord. I ask you to be my Savior. Be my Savior. And help me experience. And help, and help me experience, experience the life that you have for me. The life that you have for me. I give you my life. I give you my life. And I'm going to follow you. Follow you. One step at a time. One step at a time.
your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in the coming and you're going in the weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 he is for You're still here? Awesome. Well, I got a couple announcements for you. The first one is uh, the Alpha Program. We are starting the Alpha Program on April 22nd. And the Alpha Program is the best way to ask questions about God and about faith. And, and it's a really sweet program just to be able to have conversation with people about God and just the faith journey. And so if that's you, if, if you want to get plugged in with the Alpha uh, course, or if you know someone who needs to get plugged in with that, uh, you can email hello at scatteredsaints.ca and they can sign you up there. And so get your emails out. Plug it in, hello at scatteredsaints.ca, and get signed up for the Alpha course that's starting very soon. Uh, as well, we have a four Monday for you and your family this week. Uh, Pastor Jeremy's message was amazing, talking about the, the lineage of Isaac and just the history. And so this week, we want to encourage you to read Genesis 26 as a family, or maybe it's just you by yourself at home. And so pull out your Bible, pull out the, your phone app, however you're going to read the Bible, open up to Genesis 26, and why don't you read it and just learn about Isaac. Uh, we'll see you back here at church next week.